So we have four speakers, myself, uh, Dr. Vikram Jain. We also have uh, Dr. Deepak Mishra with us, somebody who needs no introduction, who's been conducting SSTC for so many years in AOC. Eight years plus, sir? <laughs> Ten years plus, <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, uh, we have uh, Dr. Ravi Daruka from uh, Sharp Sight Eye Hospital uh, in West Bengal, Asanol. And Dr. Gautami from RIO Bangalore Minto Eye Hospital. I'll be talking about uh, application tonometry as well as how to set a target IOP. I'll uh, start with the talk on application tonometry. Now, application tonometry basically measures the intraocular pressure uh, by providing force which flattens the cornea. It's not always so. It can either be variable force or variable area. Why we I put this first is because the most common tonometer the most accurate gold standard that we use is the Goldman prism, Goldman tonometer. This is a variable force. The area, the tip, the size of the tip is a constant. So the area is constant. It is the force that you vary when you turn the knob around. So it basically the variable here is the pressure that is being applied when you're turning the handle out there. You are going to be using external force to flatten a given area. This is the Imbert Fick law. That is pressure within the sphere is equal to the external force needed divided by the area of application, the area of flattening. This particular law is applicable to a surface which is perfectly spherical, infinitely thin, elastic. The cornea is none of these. The cornea resists flattening. There is also capillary attraction by the tears, which will pull the cornea towards the probe. Now, these two, that is the resistance of the cornea, as well as the capillary attraction, would cancel each other out when the inner area of application is 7.35 square millimeter. This is achieved when the outer diameter is 3.06. Nothing we have to break our head about. It is a constant. We just have to know it. Professor Goldman has derived all this and we are enjoying it to this day. So, but nevertheless, we should know it. Why th this area was chosen is because these two major forces cancel each other out. Otherwise, like in shorts, you'd need a nomogram for each different weight. You'd need a nomogram for each uh, different size of tonometer that is required. So when the diameter is 3.06 millimeters or the area of application is 7.35 millimeters square, these forces cancel out. Goldman tonometer is the most accurate. It is basically two prisms. And what you're seeing since it is round, the semicircles are the edge of contact. The displacement of fluid is also very minimal and hence unaffected by ocular rigidity. It is the outer edge of the prism that is visible. So to begin with, you set it at around one on the measuring setting. That is one gram of force. This is because at beyond this, if you start from zero, at around one, there is a small micro movement of the tonometer. You don't want to cause any trauma inadvertently to the cornea. Therefore, you start beyond it, either at one or 1.2 marking, that is 10 or 12 millimeters of mercury. You start and then further increase or decrease it, depending on what you're seeing. The light should come from the temporal aspect, around 60 degrees temporal is ideal with the cobalt blue filter and a 10x magnification. Beyond that, if you're using 16x, you might miss some times the Myers and you'll end up going front and back. Instill the topical anesthetic, stain the cornea, make sure that the uh, patient's forehead is touching front so that you don't have to go ahead and if the, it's not touching front, if the patient moves suddenly ahead, there might be minor trauma. So make sure that the patient's uh, forehead is against the rest and then you move forwards. When the probe just touches the cornea, you will see the limbal glow. That's when you have to slow down. After that, you look through the eyepiece, either right or left, depending on how it is set up in your, uh, in your slit lamp. Don't advance too far. The, probes, the probe might become too uh, variable in size. So this is how your end point should be. The inner rings of the superior and inferior should be touching each other. The inner rings should be touching each other, like there. They, sh they should not be overlapping, just the inner rings should be touching each other. 
the width of the mire should be approximately 10% of the circle width. You adjust the tension dial so that you achieve this end point. Mire should not be too thin or too thick. This is an ideal thickness of the mire. If there is too much of fluorescein or too little of fluorescein, you will have thin or too thick mires which may be giving a false high or low intraocular pressure. So it should not be of different size either. They should be of equal size, not too thick, not too thin. This is when the reading is lower, this is when it is higher. This is a perfect applination end point. At this point on the uh, reading on the scale, you have markings at 1, 2, 3. So that is basically you multiply it by 10. The next marking would be 2 millimeters each marking. So it will be 12, 14 and so on. There can be a lot of errors in measurement. Two things which are in your control are a too thick or a too uh, narrow myers. This you adjust by telling the patient to either blink uh, if, there, uh, if it is too thick or restaining if it is too thin. Lot of other uh, errors can be there. This is easily available. This is from the AAO book. One more point which you can uh, control or make adjustments is for very high cylinders, above three cylinders. The area of flattening won't be a perfect sphere, it will be elliptic, uh, elliptical, thereby giving a slightly higher intraocular pressure. In such cases, on the side, you have a small red line. You have to ma uh, align the negative axis on this red line. For example, if these are the K values, the lower value, 41 at three, uh, 30 degrees, you align 30 on the red line in the probe holder. Otherwise, routinely make sure that the 0 and the 1 are aligned. In case of high astigmatism, when the cylinder is more than 3 diopters or you are getting elliptical myers, that's when you have to align this small lower cylinder against the red line. The red line is actually 43 degrees away from the 0 marking. There can be inter-observer variability also. With practice, you would get it better and better. One more error is when it is not calibrated. Every tonometer is supplied with this calibration rod, which has five markings. This is the 0, 2, and 6 marking. Okay, make a note, 0, 2, and 6. So what you basically do is align it either at 2 or 6, and then fix it against the tonometer. There is a small receptacle there. is not playing. I'll show it then. I'll come back to that uh, video later. Another application tonometer which uses the same prism is the Perkins tonometer. Now this is counterbalanced and therefore can be used for children when we are doing an EUA wherein we cannot use the Goldman application tonometer. We use a Perkins. The other application tonometers, this is uh, Maklakov fixed force. The different weights are there. You stain the cornea with a dye. Measure how much of area is stained on this. Not very in force now. Just for completion, I put it up. In between patients, make sure to sterilize it. What we do, I do, is basically keep a bottle of uh, sodium hypochlorite 10%. I have three heads and two bottles. After I finish one patient, take it, put it in that bottle of sodium hypochlorite, then clean it with distilled water before I change it on. Just a small duration of even one minute is sufficient. Thank you. And now invite uh, Dr. Ravi for his talk on visual fields. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Ravi Daruka from Sharpside Eye Hospitals, Asansol, West Bengal. Today I'm going to talk about glaucoma, uh, visual fields in glaucoma. And uh, in this, uh, I am very thankful to AIOS to present me with this opportunity to talk today. So what is visual field? Simply put, it's everything we see simultaneously while we fixate our gaze in a particular direction. And glaucoma causes defects in this visual field because of particular patterns of RNFL defects. It causes particular patterns of visual field defects. And we need to recognize these defects as early as possible and start treatment with, a, with minimal damage to the visual field, which is our main agenda. So why do we need to assess visual fields in glaucoma? First of all, uh, we know reduction of visual field causes, reduces the quality of vision for life for the patient and hinders daily activity. And progressive field defect is the most definitive proof of glaucoma. 
Also, measuring visual fields help us to set treatment IOP targets according to the severity and also helps to disease, uh, in disease uh, uh, tracking. So this is how Trequire uh, described uh, visual fields as a classic island hill of vision in a sea of darkness. This hill has a peak which is the foveal sensitivity and then a smooth contour as we go towards the periphery. And it's measured by kinetic and static perimetry, but static perimetry is what has become the gold standard nowadays. Humphrey field analysis is the gold standard and what we shall focus on. It's, uh, it, uh, it involves stimulus presentation to the patient and recording of these uh, responses of the patient to these stimuli, which is a standardized procedure. The initial test detects and quantifies the damage, while the follow-up test detects stability and progression of the glaucomatous damage. The stimulus size, intensity of light stimulus and the algorithm for testing all are very standardized. These are the common testing patterns we use normally. Today mainly what we are going to discuss is the interpretation of a Humphrey visual field, the pattern recognitions in glaucoma and non-glaucomatous visual field losses and common mistakes which we may avoid. This is how a single field print analysis looks like and for ease of interpretation we, uh, we divide it into 10 zones. The first zone is the patient data and test data. The name of the patient, the age should be correctly entered and the testing condition should be proper with a pu proper pupillary diameter of at least 3 millimeters and uh, the refractive error of the patient should be correctly entered. The correct lenses should be provided to the patient so that we don't make uh, errors during the test. Also, the second zone is the zone of reliability. And here we need to see that the patient does not uh, give any high fixation loss errors or high false positive or negative errors. Also we need to uh, be sure about the fixation target which should be uh, central in a normal patient but if in there are cases of macular scars or something, we need to change the target to a small diamond or large diamond. Also the fixation monitor should be on so that we know that the patient is not moving his eye. Uh, there are some technician faults also which may lead to a uh, loss of uh, reliability of the field like if the patient's age is not entered correctly or the refractive, enter, uh, refractive error is not uh, given to the patient. The pupil size of less than 3 millimeter will uh, produce uh, unreliable fields and even not pr uh, properly positioning the patient's head will lead to unreliable fields. The fixation targets, as I said, should be proper. The gaze tracking should be on, which helps us to track whether the patient has closed his eyes or he has moved his eyes. The blind spot fixation monitoring method helps us to know the, uh, the same too. This is uh, how a, a high false positive uh, test may look like, where the patient is a trigger happy patient and he's keeping on uh, pressing the uh, button in spite no, seeing no stimulus and there are white scotomas present here. A false negative test may so, would uh, look somewhat like this where there is a clover leaf pattern here because of the uh, algorithm uh, tests in some particular points in particular times. The first, the central points are tested where the patient was uh, doing the test correctly but as uh, the test progresses he uh, probably sleeps or he is fatigued and then he produces a false negative result. The third and fourth zone are the zo uh, raw data and grayscale data which are used to derive the total deviation numerical plot. Here the raw data of the patient is compared to the uh, age uh, related normative database and uh, the deviation at each point is calculated by the machine. Then uh, the machine derives the pattern deviation numerical plot. In this it adjusts for the general reduction of the sensitivity of the field of vision. The general height of the vision is uh, reduced and the seventh best sensitivity point is taken as zero and the other points are adjusted to uh, look, uh, give a patterns, uh, pattern deviation plot which uh, gives us the more localized field effects which we see in glaucoma. So then there are the probability plots which gives us a visual representation of how, the, how, how uh, uh, likely the point is to be uh, within the normal limits or outside. So for example, if we see the solid square which says P a value of less than 0.5%, it means that's only a 0.5% chance or less for that point to be normal sensitivity and there's more than 99.5% chance that the field tested point is abnormal in this patient. Then the zone 9 indicates the global indices. Here uh, there are uh, a single number tries to give an overall idea about the field of the patient. 
the me uh, the overall the hill of the uh, height of vision uh, how how far it's reduced is given by the mean deviation the pattern standard deviation gives an idea about the localized defects and the visual field index it helps us to determine as a percentage of the normal uh, the patient's visual field the, the present visual field as a percentage of the normal for his age uh, this is how a localized field defect would look on the, on the Trequire's uh, field of, uh, the hill of field of vision. Uh, here the localized defect uh, affects the contour of the field of vision, the hill of vision. Here the pattern standard deviation will be high, mean deviation will not be affected much. In a generalized field depression, the mean deviation will be high and the pattern standard deviation will be low because the, there are no localized defects as such, the general contour of the hill is maintained. And in patients with localized, with generalized field effects, there will be both high pattern standard as well as uh, mean deviation. So the tenth uh, zone is the glaucoma field test. Uh, we know in glaucoma the field is affected, uh, 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 the hemifields are affected uh, asymmetrically. So one hemifield is tested against the other and the machine analyzes whether the two uh, fields are uh, symmetrical. Usually in glaucoma it will be outside the normal limits. So we can use the Anderson's criteria uh, to diagnose uh, if the field is glaucomatous or not. And we need to definitely repeat the fields because during OHTS follow-up, up to 86% of the visual fields on testing, on repeat testing, came out to be normal when it was abnormal of the first test. So usually glaucoma field effects will be asymmetrical across the horizontal meridian, uh, located between 5 to 25 degrees in the uh, mid-periphery. They correlate very well with the disc and RNFL changes, but we definitely we need to rule out other ocular causes of field effects in the retina or other places. Uh, we then need to categorize the fields into early glaucoma or moderate or severe field effects. And uh, so first of all, we need to see whether the field is reliable or not, and then we need to categorize it into localized or generalized effects. And if it's generalized, then whether it's a un uh, uniform generalized or it's a generalized with localized field effect. The common patterns of glaucoma uh, defects which we see are uh, nasal step, a temporal wedge defect, uh, superior or inferior arcuate defects, paracentral scotomas. Uh, then in the more advanced cases, there could be tunnel vision or complete loss of vision. There are non-neurological, uh, non-glaucomatous neurolog neurological field effects and others which may present, uh, a papilledema may present with an enlarged blind spot as in this case, um, a left homonymous hemianopia may be present in a patient with stroke. There may be a bitemporal hemianopia in pituitary tumor patients. Um, central scotoma may be present in central macular scars. And uh, an upper eyelid, dif uh, 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 upper eyelid ptosis could cause a upper eyelid, uh, superior arcuate kind of defect and so on. There are a lot of other uh, conditions which could cause glaucomatous field effects like drusens, optic nerve head drusens, tilted optic nerve, AION, etc. And we need to also avoid certain mistakes. Like I said before, a pupil size of less than 3 millimeter will give a, a false impression of a peripheral constriction of fields, which when repeated with the correct size of the pupil size, the peripheral constriction goes away. A uh, patient with a minus 7 diopter uh, refractive error when not given the proper correction will show a generalized depression like this on a total deviation but not on the pattern deviation. But as soon as we give the correct uh, uh, refractive correction, the field becomes normal. Also high fixation loss errors will result in very erroneous fields which uh, re when repeated with less uh, fixation errors, the field defects are shown to be much less. There are certain glaucoma mimickers which we should be uh, uh, wary of and uh, like an optic disc pit can give rise to a superior arcuate kind of uh, field effect. Uh, we also need to be aware that a glaucomatous patient may further come with a neurological field effect simultaneously like in this patient. The patient has a pre-existing superior arcuate defect here but now he has developed an inferior quadrant anopia due to a recent stroke. And also, uh, we need to be aware of the general appearance of the patient, like a blepharotosis could give rise to a uh, superior arcuate defect like this in this patient. And uh, so to summarize, uh, the basis of treatment, uh, visual field assessment is the uh, basis of glaucoma diagnosis and treatment. And uh, it involves a systematic approach to the field analysis printout. It, uh, the field analysis has to be uh, labeled as glaucomatous or not according to Anderson criteria and has to be 
um, categorized into early, moderate or severe defects which help us to uh, determine the treatment IOP targets and uh, we need to, uh, uh, we need to uh, further identify it from glaucoma mimickers and correlation of the fields with the uh, uh, clinical condition is a must. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. Excellent. President uh, Deepak Mishra for his talk on uh, interpretation of OCT RNFL. Mic, please. Mic on the right side. Thank you, Dr. Bikram and EIS for giving me this opportunity. So, when we all as a glaucoma expert know that what is the basic parameter for the glaucoma. Even in, even in the definition we know that it is something which is a progressive optic neuropathy and there is a loss of something means corresponding field changes are there according to the disc changes in which IOP may be the modifiable factor. I am not going in detail of this but we know that there is something structural changes happens in the glaucoma. So previously we have long back we have a tool like we are go for the perimetry and other thing to assess but in recent one decades we have something which can detect or used as a pre-perimetric means the changes or the uh, damage we can assess before the actual things which happens and the, since the structural changes occurs much before as compared to the functional changes like you have seen see the how easily are the early RNFL changes seen then after the disc changes then the visual field so if you assess anyone can assess or go by line or by find out whether if you can check the disease like glaucoma which is a permanent blinding disorder at early stage then we can go and treat it better so RNFL analysis is something which is a pre-parametric where you can assess the structural changes before and the best part is that it is not only something which much more dependent on the patient. It's the instruments, it's the gadgets and we, we are observing like in the perimetry if patient is having lot of movements, eye problems are not cooperative then difficult. But the advantage of the RNFL analysis is the shorter times and even you can do it as more objective because you can usually inspect what is the optic nerve thickness is there and again there is a quantitative estimation means measurement is there which can help you numerically to that you can find out whether it is there. So whatever the parameters are there we can go and analyze RNFL, optic nerve head and the ganglionic cell complex. All these three you can use with the help of your OCT you can detect and check and these are the something which can help you Sorry for this interruption. So, so you can go and assess all these three parameters with your OCT. Again, when we are going to analyze anyone, at least know something about the machine until unless we know about the machine, what machine is doing and what is there. In the macular scan, we can see here a 6 mm radial line or the foveal scan. When you are going for the RNFL, then it is up to the 3 to 4 mm circular scan around the disc and optic nerve head you have seen here it is a 4 mm radial line which can go. So by this way our machine will get the data from the each and different parts of the retina and uh, in the cirrus we get a retinal map which represents 6.6 .6 mm of the cube. That is the basic thing we does not know the much detail but at least you know what are the parameters we are taking. Here you have seen an image of normal RNFL you have seen good even NNR level 2 and thickening and the same thing will be reflected here in the graphical in the graph wise in the picture you have seen here that is the superior and the temporal is having inferior is having slightly more thickness as this one 
and this is the data which we are getting. If anyone is having difficulty in reading this or unable to identify this, then simply go for this RNFL thickness map. Here you have seen the double hump pattern, means here thickness is the superior and here is the inferior. This double hump pattern, you will find out, yes, it is normal RNFL pattern and again here data has been graded into the colors. Those who have in the red zone, they are having some inferior thickness. Yellow zone is having something borderline, means they are up to the normal, but they are, you can take it as a risk factor for that. They will going to be a 5% normative database and green is temporarily 100% normal. If anyone don't want to analyze this, the beauty of this RNFL by OCT is that they represent and give you data in many ways. If you are not able to correlate your parameters with map, then go for this retinal thickness map both. If not, then at least you can go for the even, it is a average map. And here you have seen in a four quadrant map, means superior, inferior, temporal and quadrant. Again, if anyone want to know that in superior quadrant, which clock hour or where you want to know, then you again divide it into the 12 clock hours and find out. Means in your fundus examination, anywhere if you find anything at just one clock hour, any RNFL or wedge defect with your slit lamp or 90D, then you can again assess that in the OCT it corresponds to same at one clock hour. So same parameter for at each, it is given at each and every places. Sometimes what happens, the patients come without the printout and the most of the time someone even in the OPD there is a habit that they will write the values, inferior 126, 121, 121. So this normal thickness is just because to know that if there is no graph is provided, no color is provided, then at least we know what is the normal range of the temporal, inferior and superior. And I simply said my resident to remember from 60 to 120. It's just a gross estimation. Means if anything below 60, it is 69 plus minus 10. That means 60 to 70. And that is 126 plus minus 70. So 60 to 20 means here is the 60 bottom and here is the 20 up. Any database where you have seen this, to remember that, that is a simple technique you can find out. I'm skipping. And these are the four, seven zones, like we go for the different zones in the HFA, there is the seven zones for the RNFL printout which we can go. B best one is the first one, we have to check for the patient ID. I will tell you why patient ID is important. Next one is patient ID is important just because it is a normative database based on the age and the gender. So remember, if you feed a wrong age, wrong gender, then there may be some variation or the changes in your exact data. That's why the age patient ID is correspond to that. Then the normative database, that is the age wise the database, they will, already system is having fitted with that, he will correlate. Then again, it is one eye, then overlap with the another eye. Since glaucoma is the disorder which is slightly asymmetrical, it is not always a symmetrical. So it can give you the variation in the both sequences. Again, I already explained that you can get semi-scan, quadrant or clockwise. And one thing more, those who are wish to do more research or anything, they want a percentile or ratio format. Again, this graph give you the information that what is the data and what is the format. Red free photographs, the choice of all of us, we usually go and use to have it for the monitoring purpose, it again say. So here is the seven zones of your standard printout. This one is the zone one here, you, if you ready, you can see the age of the patient. That is 1-8-90-36, then the gender of the female. This is again a good because sometimes what happens there, if you do RNFL and didn't, didn't save it, then in the printout you are giving the resident or the another one technician, they give the wrong printout of the same RNFL to another patient. So at least be, uh, check your RNFL report with your patient's ID to that, whether it is of belonging to the same or not. This is the normative database which we have already means machine is having for the one eye and for the right eye. This is double hump pattern and I already explained these all the things which what is the clock hour and other thing. One thing more, by the help of OCT we can also assess the optic nerve head analysis. This is again important and that is 100% numerical. 
means it can give you an idea if anyone is doing a seed, uh, suppose writing a glaucoma investigation, writing the CD ratio. So it will give you, apart from the RNFL thickness, what is the symmetry? I am telling you, symmetry of RNFL is again important. If it is, there is grossly asymmetrical or difference is there, then you have to look in that eye why there is RNFL loss in one eye as compared to another eye. Then NNR, usually we all at our residency time we used to write what is NNR thickness, normal or not, thin or thick, disc area, average CD ratio and cup volume. So even all the disc parameters which we are going to write by seeing the 90D or the 20D, we can have a double check or you can do it easily with the help of this RNFL analysis. I am skipping this side. One thing more, since ganglionic cell loss occur much before as compared to RNFL. So OCT fibers gives us one more accurate and idea about the ganglionic cell loss. So with the, the help of OCT, we do RNFL as well as the ganglionic cell loss. You have to know these parameters, this. And when we are going to check the progress, like in the uh, HFA, we are doing it. So nowadays, the OCT parameters are, uh, means these softwares are providing you to check the progression analysis graph too. Here I've seen this is a first examination baseline. There was no change. Second, no change. But in the third, in the fourth and fifth examination, you find there is a red flag zone coming. Means the changes started. So just like another progression or the field, if you patient lost the previously or you didn't document it, but you, it is saved in your system, then you can go serial monitoring of this one and check it on the system too. And progression is important. We all know that these are the pre-parametric, so it may chances that if anyone is showing progression, that it may convert to the frank glaucoma later on. There are some sources of mis misinterpretation when you are doing with this glaucoma diagnosis, one thing, because most important is we already said that it is age and gender match. So one of the important is the age. When you ask most of the patient what is the age, mostly they said 40 years. Either 60, 70 or 80, doesn't matter because they remember a 40, 30, just like that. So try to some questions or ask whether if there is dissymmetry. And another thing is that whatever the database is having, they are of the smaller normative database. But the actual RNFL variation is much larger than what we have in the machine. So it just only flag the abnormal one. Don't believe that if anyone is having uh, slightly th lesser RNFL thickness, he or she is having glaucoma or any disorder. And personally, I never suggest anyone to go on the treatment based on this basis. This is only for the screening, for predicting the future. If it is associated with high family risk, there is gross asymmetry, then the things are different. But always remember that these are a screening tools. Another of the conformer is the myopic eyes. Myopic eyes usually have the smaller or the thinner RNFL. So if anyone is having, you will find out just seeing the printout, don't judge or say that is having glaucoma or not. At least ask is or are the refractive status of that. Age is again important, but although it is already mentioned and recommended, I am just putting this slide here just to know that many nowadays it is a routine practice. So down the line, five years, six years, if anyone see that my previous uh, thickness was 122, and after 10 years or five years, he said it's 118. Now you are progressing. No, at least we know that what is the rate and what by what age we are progressing. Although machine put it in a green zone, but since we are measuring by the number, so we may confuse. So at least you know that within years there is some loss in the RNFL with the age related. So don't go for the, uh, just seeing the previously. At least check at what is the previous RNFL has been done. Signal strength that is important. Most of the time tech, um, in the many PG practice, technicians are doing it and they didn't follow the signal. At least we have a good signal strength eight. If not, then at recommended is more than six. Less than six will have a abnormal data everywhere. So at least check in each printout, it was written signal strength six by eight, 10 by eight, five by eight, it was written. So before analysis, always check the signal strength for that. 
Sometimes because of the blinking or the eye movement, you will see this black type of this data or something which is not. And most of the time, we are confused what is this, this is normal or abnormal. Then simply repeat it and told the patient that don't blink here and there. These segmental errors and something is just to ensure that where we are placed, if we are going for the macular thickness and if macula is here and we are placed, checking the scan from this area or from this area it will not match properly. So at least in most of the five restaurants or anywhere you have seen these four five lines are there. So before making printout at least just scroll and see at which graph or which we correspond best part of the uh, seen part of the macula or the disc. Media opacity is again one of the confirmer for this one. So in the very thick uh, uh, cataracts sometimes we didn't have get the good signal stand so data is not reliable but at least we can go for that for the VR persons someone is having a PVD or another thing at least go for the some media changes or media opacity present there because these black areas will block the signals and in that area the RNFL thickness may change because of that and sometimes you find out these missing data just like ischatomas these are not because of that, that is because of some staphyloma or something, some media opacities. Even this thickness map you can check and find out, yes, he or she is having some different types of this. These are more common in the high myopes of minus 8 or minus 12 in which pathological myopia is there and they have posterior staphyloma associated with them. Now coming to the conclusion, RNFL is having a good diagnostic availability and a great tool to screen the things but I again again repeat many times that it is not to start the treatment it is a supplement to check to th see the something which happens in the future and that is a more objective measurement as compared to the fields because fields is done by the patient and this is nowadays maybe in the future something else come which gives us more time bound and predicted variation with this. With these words, thank you. If any question, I'm here. Thank you, Dr. Deepak. I understand that you have to influence your treatment decision. When the fields are very uh, uh, poor, not reliable. Dr. Vikram, two, three things are there. One is the non-reliability of the field. Another, I said that is if anyone is having the family history of glaucoma or anything. Because you, as you know, there is no target pressure, nothing fixed in the glaucoma. It always have an individual variation. So we have to go. But... Uh, the, my message for the general house is that don't do treatment. If it is associated with risk factors, another thing, then judge and verify it. Yes. So you weigh in the multiple risk yes, factors. Yes, it's a multiple, a multi uh, dimensional approach means what are the risk factors, how IOP behaves. If IOP is 30, 20, then whether it is. You have to uh, treat it, yes. Uh, Glucometer means changes are there or not, we have to treat. Same if field is abnormal, but IOP is changes. Sometimes you will find out the gonio changes, means creeping angle is there, another is there. In the normal tensive glaucoma, you will find out hemorrhages there. So these are the parameters which you can pick up early, and in that way, you, it helps in the treatment and the diagnosis both. But for the normal screening purpose, it doesn't uh, help in the treatment. It's help in diagnosis and identify the early things. Thank you, Dr. Deep. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now call upon uh, Dr. Gautami for a talk on gonioscopy. Good afternoon all and I am Dr. Gautami from Minto Eye Hospital. Today in this world of ma machine dependency there are very few clinical skills which are standing out like irreplaceable. One among them is gonioscopy. 
and my topic for today is unveiling the angle the gonioscopic guide gonioscopy as the word suggests it, it's a greek word which means observation of the angle it's a clinical technique Sorry for the inconvenience. Yeah, gonioscopy by the word means it's a Greek word which means observation of the angle. It's a clinical technique wherein which you observe the anterior chamber angle by using a special lens. For any technique or an instrument, if you want to know in detail, you should know the history, how it has started, how it has changed, what all new you can think about. To know the history, there's a great person called Elio Stanta who done the gonioscopy for the first time he tried visualizing the angle of the anterior chamber in a keratoglobus eye by using a direct ophthalmoscope this is the an another person by name salzman he recognized that in a normal eye the corneal uh, iridocorneal angle cannot be visualized because of the phenomena called total internal reflection and this led to the principle called a principle of gonioscopy where Whenever the incident light is more than that of the uh, angle of the exist, uh, exit, there will be a reflection of this light, which is called as total internal reflection. And this, whenever it is less than the critical angle, it can refract out perpendicularly. Based on this, whenever the uh, lens, which is having a refractive index, which, which is equal to that of the cornea, that is 1.37, when it is placed in front of the eye, this phenomena of total internal reflection can be elevated, which led to the principle of gonioscopy. There are different types of gonioscope, direct gonioscopy and the indirect gonioscopy. In direct gonioscopy, the angle structures are visualized directly by using a different types of lenses. Whereas in the indirect gonioscopy, whatever the angle structures are visualized, these are getting reflected within the mirror and the reflection of which is seen. In direct gonioscopy, this is the technique where it can be done even in a supine position in an anesthetized patient also, where we have a light source and either a microscope or a handheld slit lamp where we place the different types of lens like corpus lens and we observe the angle of the anterior chamber directly. And these are the different types of lenses which are used for direct gonioscopy. Different like Koipe's lens, Haskins lens and Richardson's lens and many others. And the main advantage of this is you can you have a greater flexibility. You can visualize all the angles directly. And you can do it in an OT setup, especially in a congenital glaucoma and kits. And this is used as both diagnostic and surgical purpose. Main disadvantage is time con consuming and because of the reflexes and the clarity in this it's little less compared to the other technique which has led for the little modification later. There is the indirect gonioscopy where the mirror image of the angle is visualized and these are done using different lenses. These are two types of lenses. One is a scleral type of lens and the other one is a corneal type of lens. This is a scleral type of lens commonly used mostly the Goldman lens. The first one is a Goldman lens. It can be a single mirror. Two mirror lens are the three mirror lens. The other types of gonioscopes are rich and the trochal lens. Coming to the corneal type of lens, it's a gold standard where the diameter of the contact of the lens is smaller compared to that of the cornea. And the different types of this are Zeiss, Poshner, Sussman's lens and the Allen Thorpe's lens. Advantage of this is can be done in an OPD setup and it is easy to perform and it is it can visualize the structures more clearly compared to that of the direct. And the disadvantage of this is it cannot be done in an OT setup and the uh, coupling agents are required for these and the patient cooperation is much needed. 
And there's the other types of gonioscopy called manipulative gonioscopy. Whenever you are doing the gonioscopy, when the angle structures are not seen, you can ask the patient to look towards the mirror where and try to see the structures over the hill view called manipulative gonioscopy. And the other technique called indentation gonioscopy, wherein whenever you feel on gonioscopy, the structures are closed, you try to put a pressure in the central cornea and push the aqueous into the periphery, which will open up your trabecular meshwork by this technique. In this, can you see this is closed? It looks like a closed on angle on gonioscopy, but when you put pressure in the central cornea, it will push the aqueous into the periphery, into the trabecular meshwork, and this will open up your angle, which is called as indentation gonioscopy. This will differentiate between the uh, appositional as well as synechial angle closure. And there are different n number of indications for gonioscopy. One few among them is to classify glaucoma and in various other secondary glaucomas where you can clinch your diagnosis based upon the angle findings and to see for the different structures like neoascularization, different pigmentations, any neoplastic growth, recessions or any depositions. And therapeutically, you can use it for laser trabeculoplasty and gonio-photocoagulation. And when you want to break the sinicae in your peripheral setup with the, in a acute angle closures. Main contraindication is whenever there is an acute infection and whenever they have a corneal edema with bullae where it can rupture or immediate post-operative period where the high chances of infection is there or uh, whenever there is a trauma, either blunt or penetrating trauma in the immediate period. Main procedure of this is, there are three things, patient related, machine related and the doctor related. Patient related where you have to put the uh, topical anesthesia like proparakine and make the patient sit it comfortably in front of the slit lamp and you make sure that his uh, chin rest and the head, uh, head rest is at, placed at a proper position and the eye is at the uh, the medial canthus at the proper level. So the next steps, everything based on individual uh, step that how you follow. And coming to the lens, there are different types where the scleral and the corneal type. In the scleral type, we have this flanges and you have the you have to fill this with the coupling agent like methyl cellulose. And there's a one more one more uh, corneal type of lens where your tear film itself act like a coupling agent. And in scleral type of uh, uh, lens, you have to place it in the inferior fornix as the patient to look up and you gently uh, elevate the upper lid and ask him to look down and you place the lens into the eye and you check for any air bubbles or anything and it should be clear and it should be gentle because we are in close contact with the cornea and even with the corneal type of lens where uh, you can directly place it because this because of its smaller diameter and your tear fluid, fluid itself is acting like a coupling agent. Different angle structures are visualized in this, like swell baseline, non-pigmented -pigment, trabecular and pigmented trabecular meshwork, scleral spur, ciliary body. These are the normal anatomical structure, details of which, which every one of us know. And can you see in this, this is the corneal wedge where this is the point where the anterior and the posterior point is joining, which is called a swell baseline. Non-pigmented trabecular meshwork, pigmented trabecular meshwork, and this is the scleral spur and the ciliary body band. And these are the smaller iris processes which are joined. Coming to the interpretation, there are different grading systems based on which we can grade the angle of the anterior chamber. This is Schaffer grading where the angle between the uh, line drawn through the iris and the corneal curvature is measured. More than 35 to 40 is open, less than this will be the close where close attention has to be given. There are other grading systems like spade grading system, skies grading systems. These are all useful to identify the angle of the anterior chamber and what is the depth of it and different types of iris insertion in that. And each grading system has its own advantage when you follow it up after the procedure, like different other procedure like iridotomy and all. There are different abnormal structures that you can see in the gonioscopy. This is one among it. There is a broad brown color tissue which is extending from the iris into the corneal near the schwal line. This is called as peripheral anterior sinicae which you have to differentiate with that of these uh, iris processes. Those are very fine and through which you can see the inner content like the trabecular meshwork and it is not 
obstructing your angle. These are broad based and they can obstruct your angle and can increase the pressure. These are seen in the different conditions like angle closure, glaucoma, iridocornea, eye syndromes. And this is how the iris processes will look like and this is how the pass look like. And this is another picture which is showing the fine arborizing vessels in the angle that is called neovascularization of the angle seen in different conditions like neovascular glaucoma, Fuchs heterochromic iridocyclitic and chronic anterior uveitis. This is a pigmented line which is seen in front of the Schwal base line and this is not a trabecular meshwork. This looks like a pseudo trabecular meshwork. This is a pigmented deposition in front of the Schwal base line which is called sampleasis line seen in case of the hyperpigmentation like in it may be a physiological variant if it is in all quadrants or can be in PDS, pseudo fakikai and post surgery or in case of pseudo exfoliation. And then can you see the white thing band here? This is the angle recession which is usually seen in a blend trauma. Patient with such finding with two or more quadrants you have to follow up them for a longer period. They can develop glaucoma at any time. And this is the one more structure. Can you see something in the angle? This is a foreign body in the angle. And this is the red thing which is present in the Schoen's canal called blood in Schoen's canal and it can be a physiological var variant or whenever there is a CCF or superior vena cable obstruction. This is a normal but it is post trabeculectomy where there is a patent ostium. It can get clogged which is a reason for your uh, failure of trap. The main take home message in this is each one of us has to do gonioscopy independent of subspeciality. It can help you kinch multiple diagnoses at your doorstep instead of sending them at other places. Though it is retina or any speciality, it will help you to diagnose in the future. Thank you one and all. These are my references. And we are here united together to make the world glaucoma free. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gautami. Before we finish, I'll the last talk on target IOP number two. Okay. Ah. Slides, please. Yeah. So, what is target IOP? Why do we need a target IOP? Why IOP? Because in open angle glaucomas, IOP lowering is the only modality of intervention that we have, IOP lowering. So, we should know how much to lower. Lowering IOP slows down progression demonstrated by all clinical trials which have analyzed that be it the early manifest glaucoma trial or advanced glaucoma intervention study or even the normal tension glaucoma study. Angle uh, advanced glaucoma intervention study shows, showed that consistently low IOP reduces field loss. In the NTG study, it was shown that only 20% progression in the treated patients compared to a 60% progression in untreated patients. So IOP has to be lowered to prevent blindness. The OHT and NTG gave some guidelines of 20% uh, reduction in the ocular hypertension study, 30% in the NTG study, which were pro, uh, seen that yes, there is no progression or it is lesser. But just these won't be enough. We can't brand everyone as OHT or NTG and say 20% is enough or 30% is enough. There were some target IOP formulas which were proposed. Again, this is not very practical to sit and calculate all this. Uh, so therefore, how much to lower? This has to be individualized depending on that particular patient. Okay? We have to weigh the potential benefits and risks of treatment. All medications have their own side effects. We should not over treat any patient either. If you see these, both these discs appear different. Now, which one is glaucomatous? One of them may be glaucoma, one of them may be a physiological uh, cupping. So, depending on the situation, we may keep a higher target IOP for each patient. So, it is basically just an estimate that you are doing of the mean intraocular pressure, 
which is expected to prevent further glaucomatous damage. You are expecting it to prevent further progression. Whether this is achieved or not will be known only later. To customize it, you need what IOP, the baseline IOP at which damage occurred. Each disc is susceptible to a different level. NTG discs are susceptible to a lower level of IOP, therefore the target may be even lower. Life expectancy of the patient. If it's in a young patient, there are many more years for the disease to progress. Therefore, a lower target IOP is needed. Whereas if it is an elderly patient above 78 or 80, his lifespan may be shorter. So even a higher IOP may be acceptable in such cases. If the pre-existing damage at the time of diagnosis itself is very advanced, then you might need a further lower IOP. Other risk factors like uh, one eye losing vision to glaucoma itself, family history of blindness from glaucoma, other risk factors would make us choose a lower target intraocular pressure. Remember to stage each eye separately when you are trying to figure out a, a target IOP. The uh, advancement of glaucoma in each eye may be different. This is the parish classification of how to uh, stage the eye based on visual fields. But not only visual fields, you should look at the OCT RNFL data also and other things like I already mentioned baseline as well as uh, baseline IOP as well as life expectancy to decide on the target IOP. So these three factors would help you decide. A broad recommendation would be for a mild glaucoma, you set it around 18 or below. For a severe glaucoma, below 13. Below 13, it is seen that progression is very, very slow or next to none. If it's just a glaucoma suspect, then you can even give a higher range of intraocular pressure. This I've already mentioned. So customize your target IOP for each individual patient and individual eye. One eye may be more advanced if it's secondary glaucoma, a pseudo exfoliation glaucoma, one eye may be more advanced. So that eye may require a lower IOP level compared to the fellow eye. This example here you're seeing uh, moderate damage. However, it is very near the fovea. So I would put this as a severe damage itself and decrease the target IOP even further. You also should look at the rate of progression on the visual field. Now everybody progresses. It's a matter of how fast each person is progressing. The visual field, when you serially analyze, the machine has the software GPA, glaucoma progression analysis, wherein there is a regression plot that is drawn. This was the first field of the patient. This is the latest field. So a regression plot is drawn. It gives you the loss till date. Projected future loss in X number of years is given and how much of the field can be lost. Now, if you see this patient is progressing very rapidly, age of around 79. In the next two years, this patient can go blind. Definitely a further reduction of intraocular pressure is required. Probably at this stage it itself, this curve could have been generated if there was some intervention done, either increasing the therapy or uh, operating on this patient, the fields could have been preserved around there. But obviously no intervention was done. This patient has already progressed wherein the VFI is reached 40. I'll come to the importance of VFI later. So this is how the GPA printout looks. You need two years of data for this projection to be drawn. Two years and five fields are minimum. After that, this is automatically generated in the machine. Make sure to ask for this printout, the GPA summary printout. After two years and five fields, you can ask for this printout. This is drawn for the next few years and this you can manually project if necessary. So if you see a patient that is uh, progressing more rapidly, you know that you have not reached the target IOP. So target IOP is again dynamic. You set one figure initially, Serially repeat, see, look for progression. If you see that the progression is too rapid, then you revise the target intraocular pressure. I told you about VFI. Now this is something you have to be uh, aware about. Once VFI reaches 40 and below, there is disability in the patient's mobility also. So don't wait till zero. Below 40 or 30 itself, patients can have severe visual impairment. Now see this. This is the area of a relative or absolute scotoma that the patient has. He doesn't know what is there. His brain automatically just projects that there may be nothing while there may be something.
okay so this is what he would think there's nothing in that area whereas he might miss out on something driving below 30 is definitely dangerous in such cases so remember it is a dynamic uh, intraocular pressure you have to keep reassessing all the time initially assess it with time once you can monitor is OCT RNFL as well as fields and remember to reassess it can be confirmed only with time reevaluate it periodically you might have to lower the target IOP if you see that there is progress further despite all this some eyes will progress that is not something you can control those are the non IOP dependent factors so stage each eye independently and look for progression thank you with that we come to an end of uh, this talk uh, we have time for questions there are still 10 more minutes before the next any questions from the audience uh, even uh, at a slightly lower interval but ideal would be six months yes so to monitor progression we have to repeat it six months if you're seeing that it's a non-progressive patient for a fairly long period then probably you can yeah, increase uh, mandatory goldman applanation for any glaucoma suspect or a patient who has glaucoma and is on treatment but for as a screening tool it is very very accurate but you can actually use it for glaucoma treatment but with the caveat of changing the probe every single time but we know that not everyone does it nobody does it so definitely for screening yes one question for dr gautami what is your choice of gonioscope on a routine op basis so corneal type four mirror is one which we use Four mirror is your type. Yeah, it's difficult to master it initially to start off with a single mirror which has a reduced diameter is necessary uh, compared to a three mirror. Both are the same, almost the same. But since it is smaller, to uh, in initial days, I think uh, single mirror is a very ideal choice. And gonioscopy nowadays has a bigger role because MIGs are now coming into play, and everyone needs to know gonioscopy first on slit lamp before you go on to intraoperative. I think we'll end with that. Yeah, one question. Yes, sir, please. Yeah. of intraocular pressure, whether I care tonometer, the result of I care tonometer and ablation tonometer is same or different? Which one is better? I care from what my personal observations are, gives around one to two millimeters more mm. compared to Goldman ablation. That is the small range that is there otherwise eye care is very very accurate as i said if you're going to be using it on glaucoma patients make sure it's a fresh probe for your glaucoma patients yeah but if you don't have an appliance but yes. ideally gat is a must but the is the gold standard always yes yes thank you thank you sir yes madam anybody with a confirmed intraocular pressure above 30 i would treat on multiple occasions one reading yes i'll come to the ocular hypertension first uh, ocular hypertension if it's above 30 on more than two readings i would call the patient tell them educate them for five minutes of, about what they have the potential of visual loss call them after a few days if on more than twice i get it about 28 or 30 corrected to the corneal thickness then I would definitely start them on treatment. When it comes to a glaucoma suspect, a disc suspect, a lot of other things we have to look at. We have to do an OCT RNFL also to see if there is any preperimetric damage. Look at other risk factors. If the patient is myopic, if there's a family history. Again, to treat or not to treat is a big question. Just branding the patient as having glaucoma has a, a severe uh, effect on the patients itself. I would rather assess whether the patient is able to come for follow-up. If it's an educated patient able to come for a two monthly follow up and repeat the fields twice more, then take a call. If I feel that no, this patient is unlikely to come and the, there are a lot of uh, changes on the disc, I would rather treat the patient itself. Uh, in, in the glaucoma suspect, two things. One is least side effects is with dorsalamide the huh? least side effect other than the metallic taste there are no other local or systemic compliance is best with prostaglandins but the cost is a thing timolol now comes with once daily dosing also if cost is an issue i would prefer timolol 
but it has systemic side effects. So you have to weigh in all of these before deciding on what to. Yes, definitely any of the drugs can be used. Thank you. In opaque corneas, uh, I would change the probe and use an eye care because I do not have any other tonometer with me. I think you have access to a pneumotonometer or a... Yes. yes. That is then ideal, but I don't have access, I don't have it. Tonopen I don't have. So I would use a fresh probe. Uh, one more thing is that, uh, uh, one more situation is post LASIK. What do we do? Post LASIK, the most ideal would be a dynamic contour tonometer. Again, it's not there everywhere. What is also suggested is that you use an eye care at the periphery, at the periphery where the cornea has not been touched and get a vague idea. Thank you. We shall now end the session. I think Dr. Santan Gopal has the next session. Yes, sir. Over to you. <laughs>